every man, every woman, every young person in this congregation, I need you to be a warrior for God. Well, I want you to open your Bibles with me, please, to the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3. If you're using a Bible app, I'm going to be reading from the NIV version. If you want to borrow one of the blue Bibles in the chair in front of you, it's page 473. Today begins a six-week series on the topic of happy people. Would you tell the person next to you, this sermon is just for you? It's just for you. Now, the title of this sermon is, How Can I Be Happy? Anybody can stand to be a little bit more happier? Anybody? Is it just me? Is it just you? Is it, it's all of us. And so, Ecclesiastes 3 is where I want to begin. And, but I tell you that throughout the ages, people have always been searching for happiness. In fact, Socrates had something to say on the topic when they asked him, what's your advice on happiness? Let me tell you what Socrates said. My advice to you is to get married. If you find a good wife, you'll be happy. If not, you'll become a philosopher. <laughs> and some 50 years later, one of his star pupil, Plato, Plato said this on the same topic of happiness. Plato says, caring about the happiness of others, we find our own. The topic of happiness is not just for people in in historical days, it's even for people today. In fact, because the whole world is searching for happiness, the United Nations convened a special meeting in 2011 and had over 160 countries sign a pact that says, beginning in 2013, on March 20th, it'll be known as the International Day of Happiness. And so every year since then, in fact, some of you, you missed out on it. You didn't even know you had a day that you could be happy. Man, shucks. You know, March 20th went by. But thankfully, we'll learn that it's not just about the International Day of Happiness. And by the way, the United Nations established that because what they're saying is that it's not just good enough for nations to deal with economy. They have to deal with their overall emotional well-being. And why not have a day where we focus on happiness? What I've learned over the years is that people have tried to pursue happiness through a lot of ways. Some have tried to find happiness in money. How do you like my emoji? <laughs> Others have tried to find happiness with education. They just get a lot of book smarts, a lot of degrees, and they thought that'll be the source of happiness. Others look for all kinds of pleasure everywhere. Every time you hear a party, they're either coming from a party or going to a party. They're being between parties. They think the world is a party, and that's how they're trying to pursue happiness. Others are trying to pursue it in pleasure. They just lay out at the beach or lay out near the beach or lay out far from the beach, but they're trying to find some place for pleasure. And then there are others. This emoji has hearts in the eyes. They want love and romance. And, and everywhere they turn, and some turn towards sex, thinking that that's what's going to bring them happiness. But I caution you, it not, is, that's not the source of happiness. And we'll find out in a moment. Interestingly enough, get a close-up, the cameraman. Get a close-up. I have a creative team that meets around my sermon topics to come up with creative ideas. They came up with the idea weeks ago to put these emojis together to illustrate happiness. It just so happened that Time Magazine pulled, put out a special edition, and one of our guys just saw it yesterday. I don't know how, it, you know, but just the whole issue they used, and it's on the front cover, it says the science of happiness, and they have all these emojis on it. See, I was trying to, in, to connect with the culture, and it seems like I hit payload. <laughs> and so here it is right now. I didn't steal their ideas, and they didn't have a plant in our meeting, but it just so happened it was the same thing. I wanted you to know that so you won't say, man, Pastor David, he gets his sermons from Time Magazine, and that's where he gets his stuff. I thought he was a Bible-believing preacher, but he's really just a Time, Time Magazine-believing preacher. But no, let's go to the text now because I want us to understand this question, how can I be happy? And you know what I decided to do? Rather than asking Socrates and Plato, and all these other mystics, I decided to ask God the question, God, how can I be happy? And I offer you the answers. Verse 12 says of chapter 3 of Ecclesiastes, I know that there's nothing better for men than to be happy and do good while they live. 
that everyone may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all his toil. This is the gift of God. What I learn is that there are principles that God establishes, principles that are eternal, that are transgenerational. It doesn't matter what generation you live in, transnational, doesn't matter what nation you're from, these principles work for everybody, for anybody, and if we would practice these habits, we'll have the answer to the question. This passage I've just read, it has actually four habits or practices that we can actually employ right away today and be able to experience the benefit of happiness. Question, God, how can I be happy? Let me give you the first answer. The Scriptures tells me right there in verse 12 and 13, what does it say? It's a personal choice. Happiness is a personal choice. The Bible tells us in verse 13 that everyone, that's you, that's me, that's all of us, that everyone may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all his toil. This is the gift of God. There we see very clearly that one of God's gifts to us is that we may find satisfaction, pleasure, enjoyment, beauty. We may find a sense of of happiness, if you may, and he says it's there. Now, what we learn from this, apart from our physical needs of food, shelter, and clothing, happiness is a decision you must make. The Bible says that everyone, that's you. It is a personal choice, your choice. It's not wrong to be happy. It's not wrong to want to be happy. Scripture, scripture declares it's a virtue. It says that everyone may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all his toil, all his work, all his goings about, that this is the gift of God. Satisfaction, the word means the good, the pleasant, the beautiful, the cheerful, the joyful. God says, I want you to find the good, the pleasant, the cheerful, the joyful in all of your goings about. This is my gift to you. So if he's called us to experience happiness, far be it from us to fall into the trap of saying, I don't deserve to be happy. A lot of people beat up themselves, I don't deserve to be happy. That's not true. God tells us that we deserve to be happy. Even if you made bad choices, even if you fell into sin sinful pattern, God still gives us a way out of that so we can experience. He says, this is a gift from him. See, God, he implanted in each of us, in our DNA, in our cellular structure, the expectation to be happy. It is actually a personal choice. Jesus believed it. In John 10.10, 10, Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. That word life there in the text, it is the Greek word. And I reference Greek because the New Testament was written in Greek, in Koine Greek, K-O-I-N-E, or classical Greek. There are two Greek words for the English word life. There's bios, where we get biological or biological life. And then there's zoe, the Greek word, which means a God kind of life. Jesus was using the latter word, zoe. He said, I have come that you may have the zoe, you know, the God kind of life, the flourishing life, the thriving life, the satisfying life, if you may, the happy life. I want you to see, Jesus says, this is the kind of life that I have come that you may have. Paul, the great apostle, also believed this. In Philippians 4, verse 12, Paul says, I've learned by now to be quite content, whatever my circumstances. I'm just as happy with little as with much. With much as with little. I found the recipe for being happy, whether full or hungry. That's pretty heavy. In other words, happiness is a personal choice. When are you going to decide to choose to be happy? Many years ago, I was invited to speak at this conference in St. Louis. And whenever you're invited as a guest speaker, people always roll out the red carpet for you. They have someone come to the airport. They have, you know, they normally bring their best car. And so you get this royal treatment. So I landed in St. Louis and went to baggage claim to pick up my bags. And then there was this guy holding the sign, David Ireland. 
So I get my bag and I walk over to the person and you know, I, we greet one another. He has this big smile on his face and uh, come to find out he's a medical doctor, more, speci more, more specifically specialty is anesthesiology. And he was good at it. How do I know? Because he picked me up in his Rolls Royce. He had a white Rolls Royce. I don't know if you've ever driven in a Rolls Royce. I mean, if you have, I mean, you get a lot of attention from everybody else on the road. There was another guest speaker, and so I paused a little bit to see what he preferred when we got to the Rolls Royce. And so, did he prefer to sit in the front passenger seat or in the rear seat and act like he's being chauffeured? And so he chose to go in the rear. So I then went in the front passenger seat. And I'm surprised. He's sitting in the front, or he's sitting in the back. I'm sitting in the front. All these cars are staring. Little kids, little kids, they don't know anything about cars, but yet they knew that this car is exceptionally different. And whoever in that car, they must be somebody. They must either be some, some wealthy person, they must be some movie star, some famous athlete, and so everybody's gawking, looking. And so after a while, I figured, let me play the part. And so I started waving. You guys just wave. Now, when you're in a Rolls Royce, you don't wave like this. That, that, that's for a Hyundai. You wave like this. This is Rolls Royce wave. This is Rolls Royce wave because it shows you have finesse, you have tact. You understand, you're bougie. And so I wave like this. And so everybody's just looking and I'm just waving. I'm, taking, I'm eating it all, all up. Now, in the vernacular of the Caribbean, there's a made-up word called brought-up-sy. I don't know if you ever heard of that word. Brought-up-sy, it means that you have no manners. You were raised by wolves. You, were, you weren't raised with class. You know, it's like someone going to a restaurant, five-star restaurant. Instead of using a napkin to wipe their mouth, they use their hand. You know, they have no brought-up-sy. Well, in a moment, I found out that the other guest speaker had no brought up seat. <laughs> because as we're driving in this Rolls Royce, he asked the doctor, he said, doctor, he said, he said, may I ask you this question? The doctor said, go ahead. He said, how much does this car cost? Now, you don't ask those kinds of questions the same way you don't ask a woman her age, you don't ask her how much she weighs, you don't ask. He had no brought up seat, he asked. Now, truth be told, I was thinking the same thing, but, but I had brought up, see, I, so I, I didn't ask. I was thinking it, so I was relieved when he asked it. I didn't. And so he asked the question, and the doctor said, well, it cost about $300,000. And so when you hear $300,000 for a car, you just, and so for the next mile, I'm like, but my head's going like this, all the math, I'm just going. A mile later, because we were silent for the next mile, a mile later, the other guest speaker further showed he had no brought up see. He said, like the conversation didn't even stop, like a mild gap of silence didn't occur. He says, do you get a 30-year payment like a mortgage or a four-year payment? <laughs> and so, so he just threw that out there. And so the medical doctor said, look, if you can't buy the car and pay it off in four years, you can't afford it. So in other words, slap, slap, don't ask any more questions, slap, slap. And so, you know, I, answer, I got the question, I had the same question, but, he, but I got the answers. Yeah, I brought up C. But the guy was driving his rolls, he was so happy. A month later, I was invited to another conference in Ohio. Got to the airport, there was this guy, baggage came with a sign, David Iron, smiling from ear to ear. Just, just, you can see all his pearly whites, just smiling. I get my bag, I walk over to my, and he was so helped me, greeted me, grabbed my bag. He said, come on, let's go. And so he's walking briskly, I'm following him. And we get to the, to the, you know, to the parking lot, I was shocked, it was an old jalopy. I mean, this thing, I kid you not, a jalopy. Even a tailpipe, it was hanging, it, dra it dragged on the road. And so here we are, and it's dragging, and you can see the sparks flying. And again, we're getting all these looks, and we weren't getting looks from people that were happy to see us. And this time, I was waving. Yeah, this is a different kind of wave because this look was saying, get off the road, fix your car, get that junk off the road. You ever watch Columbo, that old movie, and you see his car? That was the picture of the car. But the guy who was driving it, the owner of the car, he was so happy. Paul's statement of Philippians 4 verse 12, that he'd learned the secret no matter what the circumstance, whether well-fed, whether empty, whether hungry, whether, whether, whether overeating, he learned happiness is a personal choice. And I ask you the question, when are you going to stop giving people or circumstances power over you? It is your choice 
to be happy. Happiness is a personal choice. The question was put to Madonna many years ago. At the height of her career, she made this career of self-indulgent behavior, risque, just brash. And they asked her, Madonna, are you happy? You know what her response was? I don't even know anybody who's happy. See, because money doesn't give you happiness. And not even education. You can have all of these degrees behind your name. See, I got a whole bunch of them behind mine. But I realize it doesn't bring me happiness. It can be smart but sad, smart, but depressed. I want you to see, though, go after education. I'm not knocking it. I'm saying it's not found there. It's not found there. So I ask God the question again. God, how can I be happy? Let me tell you what he said. And here was the answer from the text. You must become easily satisfied. The Bible tells us very clearly in verse 13 that everyone may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all his toil. This is the gift of God. It is your responsibility. It is my responsibility to find, to discover satisfaction, to not blame others or push responsibility on others. But I must find, I must have a threshold of satisfaction in all of my goings about. I must be able to do that. For you who are very top heavy, need more data. Dr. Alan Parducci, a behavioral psychologist on the faculty of UCLA indicates that learning how to be satisfied is a habit that happy people practice. In fact, Dr. Parducci was able to, to unearth this social science data that happy people and unhappy people have the same number of divorces, same number of car accidents, same number of losses of jobs, same number of diseases. The difference between the happy people and the unhappy people is the fact that the happy people have a more reasonable threshold of satisfaction. It takes less things for them to be satisfied. Unhappy people, they want perfection all the time. The wife has to be acting right. The kids must be getting A's, all straight A's, every kid. No one must mess up. The car must be humming perfectly. The house must be in perfect order, tip-top shape. The sermon must be good, spot on. Worship leader better sing my song, my way, my week, and finish when I want them to finish. And when all that's going well and nobody better not say anything to me that I don't like to hear. And if I get one thing out of order I'm not happy that's why you're not happy because unhappy people have an unreasonable threshold of satisfaction happy people they have a reasonable threshold of satisfaction I love what Dale Carnegie said he said it isn't what you have or who you are or where you are or what you're doing that makes you happy or unhappy it is what you think about. And I'll add, it's how you think about it. Martin Thielen, he said this on the topic of happiness. He says, happiness is an inside job. Means it's in your heart. You have to be more easily satisfied. You got to be able to get to the place where like the scripture says in verse 13, that everyone may eat and drink and find satisfaction. Solomon, the writer of Ecclesiastes, and the word Ecclesiastes means the preacher. So he is waxing eloquent. And Solomon is telling us then that life is not perfect, but our perspective must be one that's more easily satisfied than one that's not. And so I want you to see that you can't change people, as one person said, an anonymous quote. He says, I cannot change you, but I can change how I react to you. I choose to take charge of the rest of my life. I want you to see that. I can't change you. You can't change me. But you can change how you react to me, and I can change how I react to you. 
But you got to be more easily satisfied. You know what kills a lot of people for this happiness thing? They keep living for happiness to come tomorrow. It's always over the next mountain, over the next horizon, over the next bend and turn, around the next corner. But I'm saying to you, happiness occurs when you learn to be easily, more easily satisfied. You got to enjoy the moment right now. If you can't be happy now, you're not going to be able to be happy then. I remember I met the man who said that, I said, are you happy? He said, no, I'm not happy. I'm single. I want to get married. And he found the woman perfect for him. He says, I'm so happy. And they got married. Months into the marriage, they looked at each other with this forlorn look, this sense of they were just not feeling good. And then they said to each other, you know what it is. And they, they acted upon each other's statement. Yeah, we know what it is. I know what it is. You know what it is. Yeah, I know what it is. And they said, you know what's missing for our marriage for us to be really happy? We want kids. And then kids came along and the kids started cry, writing with crayons on the wall and knocking stuff off the coffee table and breaking stuff. And then they're looking at each other with this, this exasperation and saying, we're just not happy. I wait on these kids. I wait. Can't they go to school and just give me some relief? And all of a sudden the kids go off to school. Then they come back and they have homework. And so now the parents are sitting down trying to figure out how to do third grade homework and science that they forgot years ago. And they're saying, I can't wait until these kids become teenagers and do their own work on their own, then they become teenagers, then they learn how to drive, then they want a family car, then the parents can't go to sleep, waiting up at night and where is that kid? He got my car. And so they can't be happy. And then they say, I can't wait until that kid goes off to college and then get, gets on their own. Kid goes to college and they get the tuitions. They say, I can't wait until that kid finishes college and, and just gets their own job and takes care of their own financial needs. Kid gets their job, gets their own place, meet their own financial needs. The parents look at each other and said, Man, where did the years go by? I feel so lonely. I wish this house is empty. I wish we were happy. If you can't enjoy the moment today, you're not going to be happy tomorrow. We keep postponing happiness, putting it off. Next car, next job, next wife. One guy says to his wife who's 50 years old, he said, look, I'm tired of you. I'm going to get rid of you. I wanna, I'm going to get two, two 25-year-olds. Forget you. And so he just thought that that's going to bring happiness. I want you to know it's not about putting off and postponing happiness. Happiness is a personal choice. Happiness is when you're more easily satisfied. May I ask you the question, when are you going to choose to be happy? I ask the question yet a third time. God, how can I be happy? And let me tell you what Scripture tells us. Happiness is found. What does it say? Happiness is found when you pursue your purpose. The Bible tells us very plainly in verse 12, I know that there's nothing better for men than to be happy and do good while they live. Watch the word, do good. That speaks of missional living, speaks of purposeful living speaks of living with targets and goals in mind. Our big purpose is to pursue God. Our general purpose is serving God. Our specific purpose is serving God based on how we have been shaped by God. That acronym SHAPE, I love that acronym because it helps me to live missionally. S-H-A-P-E. When you know your shape, your spiritual gifts, H, you know your heart, your passion. What are you passionate about? Do it. When you know your abilities, serve the world and God that way. When you understand your personality, let it shine so you can be able to use it in the service of your life's purpose. E represents experiences. When you know your experiences, rather than sweeping them on the rug and being embarrassed about your experiences, I'm saying to you, you must begin to pursue purpose based on how you've been shaped. How can I be happy? You will not be happy doing anything outside of your purpose. Happiness is intrinsically connected to our purpose. And so the scripture says, I know that there's nothing better for men than to be happy and do good while they live. And verse 13 underscores it by saying that everyone may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all his toil, all his work, all his labor, all his goings about. I want you to see the Bible is teaching us there that when you start living missionally, 
That means with your mission in mind, when you start living purposefully, with your purpose in, in, in scope, when you start living that way, that's when you're going to find happiness. Helen Keller, she became deaf and blind when she was 19 months old. Yet she claimed her right to be happy and experience life's fullness, becoming a popular writer and a popular speaker. What's your excuse? Why can't you be happy? You deserve to be happy. You have been wired by God to be happy. Happiness is not found in money. I was teaching last night at the West Campus in Montclair, or the East Campus in Montclair, and a guy came up to me and said, you know, I was in the gym, and there's this multimillionaire. He made buku money. Money coming out of his pocket when he's working out. Multimillionaire. And he went up to him. My friend went up to him and said, you know, tomorrow's a day off from work. Aren't you happy? He said, happy? He said, how can I be happy? All my neighbors make more money than me. And people, all they want to do is take my money. I can't be happy. Money doesn't buy happiness. Education doesn't buy happiness. You know, you have your degrees, you have your PhD, some of you, your JD, MD, MBA, you, know, you got everything, but yet you're so sad. Why? And you know so much. Then you got all these other folks there, pleasure, party here, party there, smoking weed, morning, afternoon, night, and they're still sad, still sad. And what you see in pleasure, going everywhere, you just want to go. I know people, they just, they just want to see the sights. They want to see everything. They want to go to Aruba. And then from Aruba, they, Aruba, they want to go to Paris. And then they want to go to Japan. And then they just want to go to Russia. Then they want to go to Canada. Then they want to just go everywhere. I just want to go everywhere because going everywhere makes me happy. Who told you that? When my wife and I were celebrating our 25th anniversary years ago, we decided to go down to St. Kitts in the Caribbean and just be happy, spend some time, tropical island. So we're there, we're getting ready in the morning, getting ready to go out and see the sights, and all of a sudden, a knock on our hotel room door. Bam, bam. I go to the door. It was the maid. And she wanted to see if anybody was in the room, and then she stopped, and she stared at me for a minute. Didn't say anything. She said, aren't you past Ireland? I said, yes. She said, here in St. Kitts. She said, yeah, I was, I was so sad one year. I wanted to go on holiday, so I decided to go to New Jersey on holiday, and I visited Christ Church in Montclair on holiday. And so I want you to see everybody everywhere wants to go to someplace else, to be somewhere else, to be with somebody else, because that's going to bring them happy. And happiness, I want you to see you've got to enjoy where you are. If you need a bigger house, bigger car, bigger boat, bigger this, bigger that, bigger that, in order to be happy, I'm saying it doesn't come from those sources. Happiness is found when you pursue your purpose. And so I ask you the question, are you chasing hard after your purpose? Because if you're not, you'll never be happy. Happiness, it's a personal choice. It's becoming more easily satisfied. It's pursuing your purpose. And then I decided to ask God the question again. God, how can I be happy? And let me tell you what I found from Scripture or the voice of the Lord. In order to be happy, you must enjoy God. Look at verse 13. It's there in the text. It's not my lively imagination. Verse 13 says, that everyone, that's you, that's me, that everyone may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all his toil. Here it is, here it is, here it is. This is the gift of God. In other words, happiness is intrinsically connected to God. You can't separate happiness from God. You can't vet God out, siphon God off from happiness. You can't. All oh, you try, you can't. I love what the philosopher, the British philosopher and author C.S. Lewis said to this very point. C.S. Lewis said, God cannot give us happiness and peace apart from himself. Because it is not there. There is no such thing. So if you're chasing after all this stuff, why do you think I got these emojis here? In fact, I wrote a book years ago. 
I titled it the Habits of Happy People and my publisher changed it to The Secrets of a Satisfying Life. And so the idea was I wanted to look and see what behavioral scientists said to the question, how can I be happy? And you can see their research, their survey, their data, the social science, it all points to the fact that when you have a spiritual life and spiritual reality, it transforms everything. In fact, George Gallup, the pollster, he conducted a survey many years ago and concluded that less than 10% of Americans are deeply committed Christians. But the people who make up that group, they are categorized as influential and they are happy. He titled them a breed, B-R-E-E-D, a breed apart. They stand apart from everybody else. He said because they're more tolerant of people of diverse backgrounds, they're more involved in charitable activities, they're more involved in practical Christianity, they're absolutely committed to prayer, and he said they are far, far happier than the rest of the population. Because these individuals have learned the secret. Delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. Most of us as Christians, we're not all in. We're not totally sold in. Let me tell you what people, some of the people who call themselves Christians, what they do. They got one foot in the church, one foot in the world. They're straddling in both kingdoms. Saturday, they had the club twerking. Saturday, now Sunday... Now, if you didn't laugh, you said, what's twerking? That means you're not at the club. That's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. I remember there was a family in the church, and I was teaching on, you know, false intimacy and, you know, getting involved in terms of having emotional attachment to people you shouldn't be. And then I used the word, don't bring porn into your bedroom. And so the family had little kids next to them because they were first-timers. They didn't know if they should take their kid to children's church. They had the little kids there. And so the little boy said to his dad, I said, Dad, what did he say? Don't take what? And the father said, don't bring corn into your bedroom. You understand? I mean, so some people, if you don't understand what twerking is, don't worry about it. That means you're good. You're good. You're good. Now, I want you to see, you can't have one foot in the club and one foot in the church. You won't be happy because you can't even sin properly because you still have this God conscience. And you can't even live for God properly because you still have the sin conscience. you got to choose which world you want to be in. And as Gallup tells us, a breed apart, you got to choose. You can't just twist and contort the scripture you know, like some type of gymnast in order to fit into your worldview and try to make you feel like you're a believer in Jesus. Praise Him, but you're really cursing all the other times. It doesn't work that way. You can't say, I come to the church to find a good woman, but yet your heart is full of junk. Neither can you come to the church to come to find a godly man, but your heart, lady, is full of junk. You can't become a godly woman unless you repent. You can't become a godly man unless you repent. Delight yourself in the Lord, and He gives you the desires of your heart. You can't have happiness if you're in two worlds. <laughs> Choose one world. Choose one. Jesus put it this way, choose you this day whom you'll serve. Amen. Joe Theismann, who was an NFL quarterback turned ESPN commentator, he was trying to explain years ago to his soon-to-be second ex-wife why he had an affair. You know what his, he told his wife? Quote, or his soon-to-be ex-wife, God wants Joe Theismann to be happy. That's why I had the affair. God wants me to be happy. Now, the only reason someone will twist and in inject God into that is because they have their own spin on the Ten Commandments. And if truth be told, many of us do the same. We use God as like a pet. Come on in when I am in trouble. Get out when I'm doing good. I'm at the club. Good. Don't need you now. Wait outside. Wait in the car. You didn't get your wrist snapped? Wait in the car, God until I come out. When I come out, then you and I can go back home. Then you're sitting home all depressed, eating all the hagen dazs loaded down, wondering why. Because you're trying these things, these emojis here. You try all this stuff. You're picking up a guy at the club or picking up a gal at the club or picking up two gals and two guys at the club. And you're trying to say, why am I not happy? Because happiness doesn't come from there. It doesn't come from there. It comes from habits that you must practice. It's a personal choice. Choose you this day. And it's you becoming more easily satisfied. It's you 
recognizing that I must pursue purpose. It's you also saying, I must enjoy God. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. I want you to see it's there. Don't twist the Ten Commandments into your deal. You know what? Some people, they twist it. They think like the, the sixth, sixth commandment says, you shall not commit murder. But then they add to it, unless it makes you unhappy. Seventh commandment, you shall not commit adultery unless it makes you unhappy. Eighth commandment, you shall not steal unless it makes you unhappy. So they got one foot out here, one foot in here. I understand when I first came to the Lord, I had one foot here and one foot there. And that didn't last too long. It lasted a couple of months, first three months in my walk with the Lord. One foot in the church, one foot in the world. And then God dealt with me. And I decided to put both feet, I'm all in. 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 I want you to know happiness it's a gift that God gives us. It's a gift to you. And for the next six weeks as I look at it, I'll build each week. It's a personal choice. You've got to be more easily satisfied. You better pursue purpose. And you must enjoy God. Spend time with Him. Love on Him. Sit in His presence. Wait on Him. Read to Him. Sing to Him. Talk to Him. And you'll find yourself delighting yourself in the Lord. And he'll just give you himself and stuff as well. Come on, let's magnify our God. Let's praise our God. Let's stand together, please. Every woman, every young person in this congregation, I need you to be a warrior for God.